And I, and I wanted to, and I said, look, now that we've cleared this up for you, you know, now that you understand that if you believe you can never lose your salvation, you know, I love to lead, lead you in a prayer. And she says, well, no, I, I don't want to pray because I've already prayed before. And I said, well, look, when, when I got here, you said you didn't know. And the Bible's telling you that now you do know. And so now that you do know, then wouldn't it make sense for you to clarify that with God? You know, and that's the, the big difference because to me, today was the moment that she believed on the Lord. Today's the day that she got saved. But before that, she thought she could lose it by something that she could have done. As a matter of fact, the point of contention, and it wasn't really contentious, but the point of her having to overcome was, I asked her the question, I said, well, look, Jesus paid for all your sins, past, present, and future. I said, and what if in two years you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and because life has been depressing and something happened and it just things didn't work out, you know, you, uh, you decided to take your own life. And I, the reason I asked her that is because I know she's Hispanic and I know the kind of uh, indoctrination that you get in the Hispanic culture where nobody ever knows where they learned this, but they've all learned that if you kill yourself, it equates going to hell. I mean, if you ever talk to a Hispanic, you know, suicide equals hell. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall have eternal life. The Bible says that ye may know. And so what was real interesting is I saw it click. I said, look, if a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, what do they get? She's like, eternal life. How long does that last? Forever. Okay, so if this person were to take their life in two years, but they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ two years previous, what would happen to their soul? And immediately she looked at me and she said, well, I've been taught all my life that you go to hell, but the word says that you get eternal life. And I said, that's exactly right. It's either we believe on the word of God or we believe in what we've been taught. And that's why this doctrine is so important. I mean, you know, it, there's so many ways to preach this. I've seen it preach where people will use the verses uh, that people like to fight with to show work salvation. I've seen people where they say, you know, here's eight or nine or ten points. Why we're once saved, always saved. I'm just going to take a different approach, but it's all biblical. And, you know, the whole purpose is that for everybody, it clicks differently. You know, for me, it was different because I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. Before that, we were Catholic. And so for all my life, up to 20, for the first 25 years of my life, somebody told me or somebody had convinced me over periods of time that I had to do certain things to get to heaven. And then when, when I finally came to the realization that it was all in Jesus Christ, you know, that changed my life forever. Not just internally, but as I grew in the Word. I mean, I, you know, now to this day, I'm now a preacher and I get to be, uh, get behind the pulpit and tell people, you know, about the Word of God. So the first point is, We've got to look at the testimony, the eternal uh, life that the testimony gives us in Jesus Christ. So right there at verse, 1 John 5, 11 says, And this is the record, and that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So we see testimony or record, you know, it's the same thing. We're testifying or we're giving a record of the thing, and we're using these uh, terms interchangeably, but this is the record. What's a record? Well, look. You know, I, uh, I'm in a, in part of my day job is to be a financial uh, consultant for different businesses. And one of the things that we have to look at is we have to look at the records. You know, why did we not hit certain numbers? Well, what we do is we go back to the statistics and we look at the trends or the record of the way things were done. And then they give proof to why we're either in our goal or we're not in our goal. So for us, this gives us the record of why eternal life is through Jesus Christ, right? And just to, you know, I wanted to give a real quick definition of the word record. I know it's something very simple, but, you know, in this day and age, it's real important to define words because one of the things that the devil does is attack the words of the English language or even the Spanish language and changes them. You know, in Spanish, it's actually really bad because in Spanish, you know, you can go to different parts of the, the, the world and if in Mexico we might use a certain word, that in Cuba they might be different, or in the Dominican Republic it might be different, and then you're all talking a different language. Well, it's kind of the same thing in English. You know, we, we, you run into people that might understand things differently, and then you get urban uh, ways of using it, or common ways, or, you know, it's not. But we're looking at the actual correct term. So the word record, uh, it just means to register, to enroll, uh, you know, to write in a book or on a parchment, for the purpose of preserving authentic or correct evidence of a thing. So we have the word of God for preserving or authenticating the correct evidence of God's word. You know, it's, 
It's uh, just a historical event. What you're doing is you're imprinting deeply, deeply on the mind or memory as to record a saying of another in the heart. You know, it's just a cause to be remembered. So how do we know that Jesus existed? We know it because we have the Word of God. You know, because we live by faith. The Bible says, you know, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we need to know that there's a record that gives us the, it says that God hath given us eternal life. So we know that there's something that was given, brought up to account that says, look, this here, this is the Word of God. That's why we use the King James for the English language, and for the Spanish language, we use the Reina Valera Gomez, or uh, for 2010, or, you know, the history of the Spanish Bible is a little bit different, but we're not going to use anything that comes from the same writers that used uh, to write the NIV or the ESV. And, for example, the Reina Valera Gomez 1960 was, has the same type of uh, uh, corruption or perversion. And the reason we do that is because we want to get the pure Word of God so we have a pure record. You know, so the big thing is, 1 John 5, 11 is a great verse because it says, and this is the record. So if we believe God's word, well, we used to say, look, God's given us a record and he's telling us how to, how to decipher this. He says that God hath given us eternal life. And by the way, I don't understand why it's so difficult, but apparently it is. You know, I run into it time and time and time again where you explain eternal, and yet somehow people think that there can be an interruption to lose that eternity. Right? And then, and this life, this eternal life, is in His Son. And it's capitalized in the King James, which means we're speaking of Jesus Christ. You know, another thing that we need to understand that made a big difference in, in my life, and you know, I'm not going to go into my testimony, but it, it is really important because, look, let me take a step back. When I was 25 years old, I moved here to, the, to Houston to start a new business. A month later, uh, shortly after my birthday, I actually got saved. I got saved on the north side of Houston on February 15th. I have the time. I was an adult, so I recorded it at 7.25 a.m. approximately. And then I have a journal where I wrote this. Now, the information that I wrote on that journal about my salvation came about a week after I got saved because I didn't have the journal at the time. I went to a store and I wrote the journal, and then the first thing I did was put my name, and, you know, I got saved. And what's interesting is on there, I, you know, if you look, I didn't know at the time how much I had, uh, how much of an impact they had done because the person that gave me the gospel message did a good job. You know, I didn't know how to explain what salvation was. I didn't know how to really give the gospel presentation. I just got saved. You know, that's what happens, right? I was a babe in Christ. But if I go back, it says that God gave me perpetual rest or uh, eternal rest. Perpetual just means it's forever. It's eternal. And that always made sense to me as to how I knew that once saved, always saved. I didn't know how to explain it. At the age of 25, you know, that was almost 15 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to explain a sermon today of why once saved, always saved. But the one thing I always knew was that perpetual for me, I understood that word to mean forever, right? It's infinite. It never ends. And so when somebody asks, you know, are, are you saved? Of course. And you know, is there anything you can do to lose your salvation? Absolutely not, because it's perpetual. You know, I love that word. That word just kind of stuck in my brain and it did that. But it's interesting. That's the important thing about giving a clear gospel presentation is that someone, it might not all click then. There might not be the big change. As a matter of fact, most of the people we lead to Christ, they're not going to go to church tomorrow. They're not going to open their Bibles. They're not going to go listen to good sermons, but they're saved forever. You know, the lady that I was talking to, she wanted to go back to the fact that she's like, well, doesn't God say that we have to do good life and persevere to the end? And, you know, she's bringing all these verses. I said, yeah, but remember, we're his children. John 1, 12 tells us that we're his children. And I said, just like, and her son was standing right there, which, by the way, you know, we, we, we've uh, been, she gave me her number, so God willing, she'll come to church. But we're, we've been given the opportunity to go back to preach to the children because they were busy at the time. But one of the things is, you know, I said, look, this is your child. When your child misbehaved, did he stop being your child? She's like, no. And so it's just the little things that click about how you become eternal. You know, once you become a child of someone, you can't ever be an unchild of them, right? And so these are the real important things. Now turn your, your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians uh, 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and I'll read for you 1 Peter 2. And, you know, the thing that we have to understand is that the hard work, the work that actually went into it was done by Jesus Christ. 
See, because the challenge is people want to argue the works, but the Bible is very clear that there's no work that we can do. The Bible says, for we all fall short of the glory of God. So if we all fall short and we're yet sinners, how is it that we can do anything to be in the presence of God? The other thing is, you know, that's for the novice, but for us that read our Bibles, it should be very clear from Genesis all the way to Revelation that nobody can do anything to be in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, Moses saw the backside of God and his face was illuminated and he was in shock. Isaiah, when he made, when, in Isaiah 6, when he gets up and, he, and, and he's given that record where he's in heaven, He's like, I've seen the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He goes, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not worthy to be here. You know, you realize that you have no, nothing to offer the creator of, this, uh, of the universe, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. So let's go to 1 Peter. You're there in 2 Corinthians. Let me read uh, 1 Peter 2. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, but whose stripes, by whose stripes ye were healed. And the thing that we just see there real quick is he bear our sins. See, we can't bear our sins. If we've got what's coming to us, we deserve hell. You know, if you go to Revelation 21, and it last, the last part of that verse, I love that. It says, I mean, uh, yeah, it's Revelation 21, 8. And it says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone. You know, and we'll read the list, but it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers. And I love the way God does things because I really believe this is a soul winner's verse because he's setting people up, not, not for failure, but for success. Because, you know, when, when you're going through that list, it's kind of this pat on the back. But the fearful, oh, I'm not afraid. And the unbelieving, oh, I don't I'm not, that's not me. And the abominable and murderers, well, I've never killed anybody. I, I've, man, those people are bad people. You know, the whoremongers, man, that's, that's bad. You know, that's what happens. You know, I, I see their face when I'm reading this and then like, and the sorcerers, oh yeah, I've never even practiced magic. I mean, I don't know what that's, and then idolaters, you know, and, and they don't think they worship idols because, you know, even Catholics don't think that praying to the saints is evil. And all liars, and then when you get to all liars, you say, I mean, can we really sit here and tell each other that we've never lied to each other? That's a lie. And then all of a sudden it clicks, right? And it says, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But what's interesting is, you know, the hard work was done by Jesus because even if we just lie, we, don't, we deserve hell. We, if, if in our flesh we have to uh, justify ourselves, we deserve hell, period. End of story. So the Bible, go to 2 Corinthians 5.18. Let me just give you a couple of verses that show that he did the work. This is the, the purpose of this point is just to show you that Jesus did the work for, for us. Uh, you know, and it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus, and hath given to us ministry, the ministry of reconcili reconcili uh, reconciliation. Man, the weather's really <laughs> messing with my throat, so just pray for me. It says, To wit... That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, Jesus had to be made sin, even though he didn't know sin, so that we could, so that, uh, we could be made righteous of God in him. And the two words that I want to focus on there is reconciliation. You know, and there's another definition. It says, the act of reconciling par uh, parties at variance, the renewal of a friendship or disagreement or enmity. You know, in Scripture, the means by which sinners were reconciled and brought into the state of favor with God. But what I like is they're at variance. You know, when, when you're doing accounting and you're reconciling accounts, they have to balance. If they're not balancing, they're out of balance. The only way for our life to be in balance, the only way for the debits to equal the credits is for God to pay the, sin, the, the sins of the world. Because if we look at our works, we're always in the, in the negative. We can never balance it out. There's not enough transactions on this side of our life to pay for this, 
for the eternal life to get it in heaven. We, we can't. The Bible says it's, we're separate. We're, for God to love, I mean, uh, for the wages of sin is death, right? It says, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I love that because the way you come short is if you, recon, if you don't reconcile a, uh, uh, an accounting uh, balance sheet, something's short. You either have too much money because somebody messed the numbers up, but usually it's because there's not enough money to make up this money because somebody didn't do something right. Either they're stealing or they're fudging the numbers or they're playing with the numbers or anything. Well, for us, when we look at a picture of heaven, if we were to look at the accounting, the only accounting that God's going to look at that says this is balanced is Jesus Christ. If we get up there and we're like, look, Jesus, I mean, look, God, we did this, 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 it just keeps getting worse. There's nothing to, there's nothing to get us up here. But the only way we do that is through Jesus Christ. He reconciles us. And then the other thing that I like is that word, go back to uh, verse uh, 19, it says, not imputing. And if you look at the word imputing, it means uh, attributing or ascribing. To impute something is to put it on to something, to charge it to something, to set to that account. You know, so it, it means to like, uh, uh, so for example, in life, there, there's uh, times when people go to jail or prison unjustly. They were accused or they were, had those crimes imputed on them, whether they were righteous or not. Well, that's the same way with Jesus' death on the cross. He had our sins imputed on him so that they wouldn't be counted towards us when we go to heaven. So if that's done, then it's once saved, always saved. Because the only way that that happens is the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the, on the cross. Because if we have to do something then we're always going to be constantly either winning it or losing it. Because guess what? In life, we're either in the spirit or we're in the flesh. You know, it says, while you were yet sinners. But let's go, let, let me not get ahead of myself. Turn to Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, verse 22. Hebrews 9, and we're going to be there in verse 22. And we're going to see a little bit more of uh, what Christ did on the cross. For, it says there, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than, the, than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now, now to appear in the presence of, of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood, with blood of others. For then he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in is appointed, it is appointed, uh, but now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so we see here that God sent his son to offer himself once. But what I like there is, you know, people will argue this, but how do you argue? You'd have to be an idiot to argue. Verse 25, it says, nor that he should offer himself often. Nor that he should offer himself often. You know, the greatest thing that happened today was that lady said, well, my instinct tells me that, you know, that person would go to hell, but the word says that they have eternal life. That's it. That's all that you need to do to understand that it's once saved, always saved. You know, I said, if somebody in two years kills himself, and, but they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, where do they go? And she said it. She said, my instinct. You know, she didn't use those words because I'm translating, but my instinct, her instinct was to say, hell. But she said, but you just showed me in God's word where it's forever. See, and that's the point where we make that transition is when we believe on the Lord Jesus, we believe on the word, which is the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, nor that he, verse 25, nor that he should offer himself often. In other words, he's not going to do, he, he hasn't had to die often over and over and over again as the high priest entered the holy place every year with blood of honor. And then it says, for then 
Must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world? I mean, that would mean that today Jesus Christ would have had been dying and dying and dying and dying. And you know what? I sinned, so there goes Jesus to die for me again. Oh, what? There goes Rene, they're renaissance. There goes Jesus to die on the cross again. Oh, Jesus, there goes Rene to die on the cross again. Brother Je you know, there, there goes Jesus. To, that's not the way it happened. It says he offered what? It says, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men to die once, but after this is judgment. So Christ once offer, offered to bear the sins of many. That's it. One time. It's a sealed deal. You're born once physically. You die once physically. Guess what? You're saved once spiritually. Once saved, always saved. I mean, that makes, that should be the reason why we should get more excited about soul winning every, every day and why we should improve our soul winning program. As a matter of fact, the only program that this church is interested in improving is the soul winning program. You know, if we get all these other programs, great. But if we don't, great also. You know, the only program that we should be concerned about is the one about so many, because it's the one that matters for all eternity. None of these others will change anybody's life more than giving somebody the spiritual gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, so let's look at now, go to John 3, 15. Go to John 3, 15. And I just want to cover just for a few seconds that it's all by believing. And the reason I'm doing this is because obviously if we're going to preach once saved, always saved. We also got to just cover the points of what it means to be saved. John 3, 15 is a great set of verses. And I wish I had time to go into all the verses that talk about believe or believeth or believing. But this should do uh, this sermon justice. But John 3, 15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I love these set of verses because nowhere in there does it say believe and go to church, believe and follow the commandments, believe and do this, believe and do that. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there's believing again. And who is it? Whosoever. Whosoever believeth in him. I, that's why we go out soul winning, because it's anybody that we knock on the door has the opportunity to believe and have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, through that, that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, let's see if we see that, that theme again. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And you notice that you have to have the light first and then the deeds. Here is saying that the darkness did deeds. That's why they wouldn't come to the light. It says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, one of the things I, I, don't, I, I don't like about modern missionaries, I think we should have missionaries in the world. The Bible tells us to go out into all the world. But modern missionaries, and this is before I even was a preacher, this is before I understood it, I never liked uh, the missionary work because one of the things that would always happen is when I would go to other churches and you'd meet the missionaries, you're like, so how many people did you guys lead to the Lord? And they're like, oh, well, we're, we just, we're just getting started. We're establishing ourselves. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, well we're a, a health missionary. We're going to go and we're first going to fix their teeth and we're going to fix their health and give them free medication and surgeries. And then when they're all feeling good, then we're going to preach the word of God. Well, the Bible says right here, in verse uh, 20, it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. See, the first thing would be to do the truth, is to show them the light, so then we can do the deeds. See, I would much rather give somebody the gospel than fix their teeth. I would much rather give somebody the gospel than make them healthier. Because I know that if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I can never save them, if they die, 
they're going to go to heaven. See, the challenge is, you know, I, we got a couple of people sitting here from Cuba and Haiti today. People go to those countries all the time, and they do do that. They give you free food, and they give you free medicine. Los Americanos, the Americans are here, you know, and they're going to give you all free stuff. But those people still die in those countries, even if you give them all that stuff. And if they didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? They're dying and going to hell. The Bible says that's an evil deed. It says here, uh, it says, Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Let's go to John 3.36. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. So it's, if you don't have the light, the wrath of God's abiding in you. You, you. you want to get out of that wrath by believing on the Son of God. Let's go to John 12, just a couple pages over. John 12, verse 44, says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. You know, in John 14, it says, Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, in order to believe in God, we have to first believe in Jesus. Because it's the only way to God. And that's, the, that's another way that you know that one saved, always saved is so important because there's no other faith, biblical faith. That's why we're also Baptists, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. But that preaches the Word of God. There's people that believe in God, but they don't believe in the God of the Bible. And there's people that believe in Jesus, but they don't believe that Jesus was God Almighty and that He was the Son of God. So we have to be very careful that we preach a clear gospel message from the word of God. It says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And so we see that the commandment is life everlasting through Jesus Christ. And I think, I mean, uh, you know, obviously we could go into much deeper, but I think we covered enough verses that use the word believeth on him for everlasting life. And, and people will sit there and they will still argue that you have to do this and you have to do that. And, and it's not. It's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the problem is, you know, this lady thought she was saved and she actually wasn't off on her gospel. She, she knew the verses that I was quoting to her. And she uh, knew, and you know, obviously, when I prepared this message, I didn't have this experience, but that's how the way that the Lord works. She knew the gospel, but because they didn't ever teach her salvation, nobody ever cared for her soul enough to tell her that she was going to hell, she thought that she had to do all these other things. Think about it. I don't know how long she's been going to church. Long enough to know the verses that I was talking about, and it was a lot of verses. Some of them she was quoting from memory. So you're telling me this lady who had grown children, I'm thinking these guys, the two guys that were there were probably 18 and 19 years old. So for as long as, I mean, she's probably between the ages of 40 and 50, 50 years of her life, let's just say she's 50, going straight to hell. Because nobody told her that it's one saved, always saved. And they gave her the gospel. I mean, they gave her the message, but nobody ever completed the message. Because they always want to add works to it. They always want to make things about themselves. You know, so I'm just going to do a couple, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm just going to give you a couple examples of what we run into here. You know, and, and it's funny because that's actually one of the things that she, that she brought up is people will say, well, isn't it necessary to follow his commandments and do his will? And she kept talking about how, you know, what if someone, you know, believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, but then afterwards they go back to their life of sin and they drink and they fornicate and they do all these things. You know, doesn't God require of us to uh, lead a good life? Not to be saved, because we're all sinners. 
Now, he does require a good life if we want rewards in heaven. We want the crowns and the victories. And she actually agreed with me once I explained it. And we went through the scripture. But what's interesting is she thought that that, that was necessary for her to get to heaven. It wasn't until we removed that and separated it out that it's salvation and the walk are two different things. You know, it's not necessary to walk. But go to 1 John 5, 1. You know, is it necessary to follow his commandments and do his will? Well, the Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And so, if you notice, it didn't say anything about it being necessary for salvation. Now he's encouraging us. He says, this is how we're going to know, brothers and sisters in Christ. But uh, the other thing is, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Let me ask you a, a question. If, if you have children, you know, I have two little children, you know, and uh, they're, obvious, uh, they're getting older, but I don't know that my baby child, my one-month-old child, love me in the sense that what the Bible explains they just don't have a concept. You know, I don't, they, they were barely forming a concept of the world. You know, my daughter's just starting now to speak. Now she says, I love you and these things. But was it necessary for my daughter to love me for her to be my daughter? No. I, I mean, you don't have to love God to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting is if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you just love God. You love Jesus because you have this eternal life. But it says, we loved him because he first loved us. It wasn't a requirement, right? And here we says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's verse 1. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. So he's telling us, look, after salvation, here's how you can know the children of God. And here's how you, why you want to keep his commandments. You don't do these things because you're going to heaven. You do them because you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's your natural inclination, right? Matthew 7. Go to Matthew 7. And then we're going to be in Romans. Go to Matthew 7. So now we, we, we discuss the commandments. Let's look at the will. Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew 7, you know, and I've seen people actually when they go soul winning. This is not what I use soul winning. But I've had people explain this. And that's why I use it, because I think it's a very good example of explaining the will of, of the Father. And in Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work iniquity. You know, the Bible says that, that we have to do the will. The, uh, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. And what's interesting is he's talking about the will of the Father, and then he goes on to describe all these people that are coming and bragging about works. And he says, look, I never knew you. So if the will of the Father was to do works, wouldn't it make sense that the next verse would be, hey, these people came to me and said they did these things and that they cast out uh, devils in my name and that uh, they prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works. And that's why they're all going to go to heaven. That's not what it says. It says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. John 6, 47, go to Romans 4. John 6, 47 says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I just threw that one in there just to make sure you had another verse that said, all you got to do is believe on Jesus, believe, and have everlasting life. But what's the, 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 the crux here? We see in Romans 4, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now unto him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, 
His faith is counted for righteousness. So we see that it's not works, it's faith. As a matter of fact, the, the individual described there in verse 5 does not need to... Um, does not need to work to have eternal life. That person just didn't work, and they had eternal life. And so we see that, uh, you know, these are the things that, that are, are going on. So the will of the Father is that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, not to him that worketh not is the reward of, not reckon of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And uh, give me a second here. And uh, if you go, sorry, I got ahead of myself. And, and here, here's a great example. I, this is great for the once saved, always saved. Is that I knew where I was going with this, and, and, and I, I forgot to put that verse in there, but, you know, thank God I, I know where it's at. But the will of the Father is described in John 6, 40. You know, I made a mistake in my, in my preaching right now. So it's a good thing, you know, because that's life. That's how you know that it's once saved, always saved. Because one of the, the misconceptions also is that, you know, if you're behind the pulpit, that somehow you're, you lead a better life than the people sitting in the congregation. I'm not talking about this church, but there, there is churches like that. The Catholic Church, I mean, the Pope is deity on earth. Now, we know that's false, but people think, oh, the Pope will never do anything wrong because he's the Pope, he's the preacher, he's the pastor, but that's not true. We, we all fall and come short of the glory of God. Even when we're up preaching, we can make mistakes, but go to John 6, 40, actually John 6, 39. Uh, let's, go, let's go back one. Uh, let's go verse 38. John 6, 38 says, For I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. And so we see that the will of the Father is to believe on Jesus and have everlasting life. And so, you know, even though I skipped it on my notes, the Lord made sure that I memorized this for when I go so winning so I knew where to come back to. But that's the beauty of what's going on is that even though we're infallible, I mean, we're fallible, God's word is infallible. Even though we make mistakes, God doesn't make mistakes. Even though we might preach it wrong, He doesn't preach it wrong. See, it's your responsibility to go back and learn the Scripture so that when someone like me makes a mistake, you can go back and correct it yourself and then teach your family the right way. Let's go ahead and just close this out. You know, what if we reject God? We are a spiritual, but we, we can't reject God because we're His spiritual children. Go to John 10, verse 22, and it says, and it was... Uh, John 10, verse 22 says, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be Christ, the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. See, I, it's going back to the point that Jesus did all the work, right? Verse 26, but ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones to stone, again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do ye stone me? And the reason I closed out with that is because he, again, he talks about the works. Who's doing the work? Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're like, no, we want to know. They didn't want to know. They wanted to get justified because they, they were in church and doing all the things that they thought was good. But God said here, look, it's because of the good works that Jesus is doing that nobody's going to perish. He says, and... I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And we're in Jesus' hand and we're in the Father's hand. You know what's interesting is, you know, they, uh, when my wife was born, I mean my wife, my, well, but when my wife was born, my, her parents were happy, by the way. But when my daughter was born, we were really happy. But the, the, one of the nurses came in and she said, they, they made us go to this class. It was really weird. They made us go down to another room before they, they let us out of the hospital. Uh, 
you know, my wife had a uh, high blood pressure at the end, so we had to be delivered. We had to deliver Luciana at the hospital. And when we were in the hospital, they made us sit in this class. But the one thing that we took out of the class was really cool. Is they said, "Look, the baby, you know, they're kind of blind. They're learning their sight in the first few days. They can smell their mother's uh, breasts. They can smell the mother's breast milk." They said that the baby could pick out her mother from a room of, you know, random women because they're linked, right? Once you're a child of that person, you know, and you, when you hear your, your child's voice, it's sweeter than all the other children. I love all the children in our church, but when I hear my children's voice, it's sweeter than all the other children. I recognize it easier, right? The Bible says, look, when we're his sheep, we recognize his word. We know who he is. We can pick him out from a group of false prophets. We can prick them out from a group of false churches because it's his word. As a matter of fact, you know, because they're here right now, but it's interesting when uh, uh, Renee and Giselle showed up to church the first time, I actually tried to kick them out of the church because they, they're Spanish speakers mainly. And as a matter of fact, they don't understand like maybe 50% of what I'm speaking right now, but they still sit in church. But you know why they're here? because they recognize the sheep, I mean the, the shepherd. They're sheep that recognize the shepherd. I said, no, look, there's a Spanish church down the road. They're like, no, we're here because of, they recognize God's word. It had nothing to do with the, the fact that, you know, they, that I'm the only one that spoke Spanish in the church or that Pastor Cobb, you know, pre- they recognized that God's word was here. It was being preached here. And, and to this day, I remember, I actually tried to kick them out of church and they wouldn't let me kick them out. That means that God, you know, I couldn't even kick them out of a Bible-believing church. How let alone can you be kicked out of heaven? Because God's always going to take care of his people. He won't leave you nor forsake you. But let's go, go ahead and close out. It just, you know, that, that just really stood out to me because the reason that uh, they were here initially was because they were looking for a Bible-believing church that preached God's word. It didn't matter the language. They wanted to be in the truth. And the truth is what sets them free. But let's go to Romans 5, and we're going to close out. If all of this didn't make sense, if my mistake in the middle of the sermon didn't make sense, if, if you think that you can you know, out-argue all the points that I made and you have all these other verses, I don't know how you debunk these verses. You know, There's really nothing that can separate us from Christ after we believe. Right? Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And and I just love that word yet. I love using Romans 5.8 because it says yet, you know, and if you look at that, there's several definitions. But, you know, that it's still if you look at the definition of yet, one of the definitions is still right. It's still happening or even uh, beside or over and above. Still, the state of remaining the same, it says that while you were yet or still remaining the same, meaning you were still a sinner, Christ died for us. It doesn't matter what state we're in, Christ died for us to give us eternal life. And then just go over to Romans 8, two, a couple pages over in your Bible. And verse 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. See, we can't, once we believe in Jesus Christ, nobody can lay a charge to us. Who is he that that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So the question is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are 
uh, counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, I am convinced, is another way to look at it. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you can't reject God because he, he says not, you can't even separate yourself from Him. Trials and tribulations can't separate you. Life and death can't separate you. Height, depth, principalities, angels, powers, things present, things to come, nothing can separate you. So the finality, the purpose of the message is that once saved, always saved. You should have that confidence that you know that you have eternal life because you believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to preach this message. And Lord, just help us to prepare for, you know, whatever uh, the rest of this year uh, unfolds for us. The Bible says even the things to come or the present things can't separate us from you. And, you know, we're, we're coming up at, uh, in March uh, as we begin... The, the end of the first quarter, you know, it's our goal, Lord, that we should ramp up our soul waiting and we should ramp up our Bible reading and our Bible learning and memorization. But for the purpose of clarifying and being more clear and more truthful and when we're doing truth, when we're giving the gospel, when we're preaching your word and when we're letting others know that once you believe, it's one saved, always saved, so that nobody ever feels like they're walking this tightrope where it's just a matter of time before they, you know, you're either on the, you're either in hell or you're in heaven. You know, what if, what if you died and you didn't ask for forgiveness or all that? It, none of that matters. And, you know, I pray that I made that clear today with the scriptures and I pray that, you know, it edifies and it helps those and it strengthens and that it, it uh, just, you know, gives us a new resolve to go out there and go soul winning for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.